For once, I had no prior experience to work off when playing through Prototype 2, and I was intrigued to see where it would go, even if reading the connecting comic explaining why Alex is a villain now did taint my expectations somewhat. This, this is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. Nonetheless, I'm happy to say that I had a much better time than with my previous entry, even if the bar for an enjoyable experience was buried in the ninth circle of hell. I'm going to try and be charitable. I want to like this game, and I did enjoy parts of it. Prototype 2 is a decent sequel, and for people just stepping into the series, it was a great game with fun gameplay and stylish cutscenes. If I sound backhanded, it's not necessarily on purpose, it's... On its own, this is a good game, but in my opinion, when compared to what came before, there are clear gaps. The combat, while fun, has been significantly gutted, with many abilities, combos, and even some powers just outright removed. As an example, in the first game, you could do an unarmed move where Alex slammed his fists together, causing a shockwave that knocked enemies away from him. This gave you space and even killed weaker targets, which was especially useful when you were being swarmed. That's gone in the sequel, along with all the other unarmed moves and more, which really slims down your options. I mean, you can still punch people as unarmed abilities, but like... <laughs> that being said, the combat and the movement is still fun, although it did trip me up the first time when they decided to change how jumping worked. In the first game, you charged a jump and launched when you released the button. In this game, you launch immediately and your height is determined by holding the button down. It's awkward and changes the flow of movement to something that feels clunky and imprecise by comparison. If you want a more in-depth take on the actual mechanics and gameplay, I recommend this video by White Light, which I will link in the description. It's quite good. I appreciate the menu offering us a recap to explain what happened in the last game, though the decision to frame it in-universe as a briefing given by the people responsible for the virus existing in the first place is an odd choice to me. I'd be less opposed if the plot of the game was learning the truth about Blacklight's history and that the Alex Mercer we played as was actually doing his best to undo the damage his namesake caused, that the research wasn't to protect America from a biological attack, but to create something that could target specific racial groups, and that Mercer only hijacked the nuke at the end because it would have killed every last innocent survivor in New York, and the infected were already very weak because Mercer had killed their leader, Elizabeth Green. I'll talk about this more in the next video, but I just wanted to highlight it here because it's part of my main issue with the story, which we'll also get into later. But let's get on with the story, shall we? We begin our journey with a recap of the first game's events, but strangely, as I said before, this is delivered to us via Red Crown, the operational AI of Blackwatch, and therefore heavily biased in favour of making Blackwatch look like the good guys, when it claims that the group was formed to protect America from biological attack. And if you'll cast your thoughts back to the first game, Alex explicitly states that the purpose of the Hope Idaho experiments was to create something that could target specific racial groups. So. Already off to a great start revision-wise, as if this is your first step into the series, you're not inclined to think that this is a flat-out lie. Also, when Hope was infected, it was by the Red Light virus. The Black Light virus was created from Red Light by Dr. Alex Mercer when he was still human. In a different timeline, this would be great as a setup for bringing Blackwatch down as the real villains of the story. There's not going to be a twist, you stupid slut. We cut to an opening montage of military footage interspersed with shots of domestic life as we follow phone conversations between James Heller and his family. These progress from sweet to deeply worrying as the second outbreak occurs. And as much as Heller tries to reassure his wife and keep things calm, when he finally gets home from deployment, it's too late. The sequence is genuinely good. The rising tension and somber tone are perfectly executed, just like Colette and Amaya. With his wife and daughter promptly stuffed in a fridge to serve as character motivation, Heller demanded to be put on patrols in the deadly red zone, the heavily infected and all but destroyed remains of southern Manhattan. The northern end of the island is, um... Yeah. 
Yeah. While Heller might have been a loving husband and sweet father before, now he only cares about killing Mercer and doesn't much care about dying in the attempt. It's noted in his file that because of his PTSD and his fixation on Mercer, he should be placed on indefinite leave. However, thanks to worsening losses in the Red Zone, his request is granted. Stellar. Mayhaps they should stop sending soldiers to a zone that's almost guaranteed to be a death sentence nine times out of ten, but I'm sure if they just keep throwing bodies at the biomass virus, it'll work out for them eventually. I guess it's cheaper than providing therapy and medical care to your veterans. In the middle of moodily sharpening his knife, Heller's convoy is attacked and destroyed, leaving him as the only survivor. When Mercer shows up, Heller is ordered by Red Crown not to pursue him and to fall back, but Heller retorts that he isn't a part of Blackwatch and slits Mercer's throat from behind. He's promptly yeeted across the street because for some reason he expected a cut throat to take out the guy who can survive a nuclear blast. Nonetheless, after briefly looking at a picture of his daughter, Heller tries again with the same result, and Mercer just walks away. Full disrespect. We pursue Mercer through the dark, ruined streets of Manhattan, and I have to say, the opening sequence of this game was very good at making you feel vulnerable and kind of maybe want to play a survival horror game in this setting. Narrowly avoiding being crushed by a Goliath, Heller manages to kill a lone brawler with just a knife, which impresses Mercer enough to infect him. He passes out and wakes up in a Gentech facility being experimented on by Dr. Koenig, who is overseen by Blackwatch leaders Riley and Rooks. Naturally, the good doctor wants to preserve his priceless specimen, but the soldier boys are more interested in containment and order Hella's room burned if things get out of hand. Bursting out of the facility, we're briefly accosted by Mercer, who explains that he didn't kill Heller's family, that the outbreak is a bioweapons test by Blackwatch, who are blaming him for it, even going so far as to call Blacklight the Mercer virus and that he wants to destroy Blackwatch, Gentech, and the virus. He even shows Heller how to consume another person to grant him memories that point to Blackwatch's shady bullshit. Again, this would be great if we were actually teaming up with Mercer from the first game to bring down Blackwatch and Gentech. There aren't a lot of games where you play as a superhero type with a setting and powers this dark, but this character is Mercer with the serial numbers filed off and we need a final boss, so rest in pieces. Left to his own devices, Heller seeks out the guidance of a priest he's familiar with, Father Guerra. We learn from him that Blackwatch has been rounding up healthy people, giving them the disease and putting them in cages with infected monsters, all of which feeds into the narrative Mercer gave us. To motivate Father Guerra into action again, Heller starts carving through Blackwatch in the Yellow Zone, consuming commanders and derailing their very justifiable and not at all ethically bankrupt release monsters on innocent civilians operations. With his faith that the situation isn't completely hopeless restored, Father Father Guerra resumes his resistance networking, supporting Mercer's crusade against Blackwatch and Gentech, and encouraging Heller to do the same. It isn't explained where exactly Father Guerra learned to hack networks and organize resistance movements, but his remark about having a lot of tattoos removed leaves the door open for interpretation. At this point, I spent some time running around collecting black boxes, ostensibly this game's version of the Web of Intrigue, because the memory collection is heavily tied into the side quests, and it felt written to facilitate them rather than reveal anything particularly interesting about the setting. Some of the black boxes were interesting, a lot of them just kind of reinforced how wretched Blackwatch is as this game pushed their moral bankruptcy so far over the line that it just became too absurd to take seriously. However, there were a couple of exceptions. Black box number six in the yellow zone is a mother begging for the life of her young son. The soldier believes him to be infected because he won't talk, but the mother insists that he's just autistic and being non-verbal is normal for him. The soldier doesn't believe her and opens fire to her horrified screaming. This one gave me chills due to its grounded nature. It felt like something that could happen in the real world right now. Hell, it does happen. Autistic children and adults are hardly treated well by the public at large, and when it comes to interactions with police, things can and do escalate, because when you give someone a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The next two just flatly made me uncomfortable and felt tasteless. Black Box 12 in the Green Zone is a conversation between the dead soldier we looted it from and Colonel Rooks. The Colonel threatens this soldier with non-judicial punishment for daring to stop his fellow soldiers from a civilian, likening the act to saving a cow or a lab rat. Meanwhile, Black Box 14 in the Green Zone is a conversation between Colonel Rooks and Lieutenant Riley discussing a brothel for the soldiers, which Rooks brushes off as just human nature. And in the context of the last recording and the fact that Black Watch is just wholesale snatching civilians off the street to feed into the meat grinder of lab experiments, 
This immediately just made me think of Japanese comfort stations. Thanks. I hate it. Eating our way through the scientist buffet, we eventually get ourselves into the same room as Colonel Rooks, the man who ordered Heller's termination at the lab, and learn about a Dr. Schaffeld performing those inject healthy civilians with the flesh-shaping horror virus experiments. We promptly wipe out Sheffield's team and eat the good doctor himself, rustling the jimmies of his superior Dr. Bellamy, and uncovering something called Phase 1, a project that involves injecting civilians with DNA from the more advanced monsters Blacklight creates. At the Phase 1 facility, we fight an overgrown trouser snake and consume it, gaining the new tendril power, which allows Heller to tear people apart with spiderweb ropes of sticky flesh. Neat! Father Guerra points us in the direction of Bellamy with the help of an old contact known as Athena, and after chewing on some Bellamy brisket, Black Watch sees fit to attack the Good Father. This goes super well for them. Guerra flees to the green zone and puts Heller on the trail of Dr. Koenig with Athena's help, leading to a confrontational meeting where Koenig reveals that Gentech is forcing him to work for them. He reminds Heller that he tried to keep him alive before he escaped the lab and warns him about Project Orion, super soldiers built to fight threats like him. About that. In order to completely shut down the project, we head to a repurposed stadium where the only remaining Phase 2 Orion specimen is held, an existing super soldier infused with Heller's DNA. Which is why that soldier has Heller's voice. Because that is how that works. Consuming the super soldier unlocks our first critical mass ability, an explosion of tendrils that eviscerates everything around Heller and gets anime fans very excited. The man in charge of this project tries to make a run for it, but Heller easily catches him and dines on some delicious Burke brioche. Unfortunately for Koenig, Burke's memories reveal that his well-meaning and doddering old man persona is a fucking lie. Tearing our way through more shady scientists and unscrupulous soldiers, Heller flushes Koenig out into the open, crashes his attack helicopter, and goes in for the kill. What are you? I'm what you could have been. So yeah, we fight Koenig and consume him, revealing a critical conversation he had with Mercer that proves that everything he said at the beginning to be complete horseshit. He's infiltrated Gentech and Blackwatch, with another evolved like Koenig about to take over as CFO, Sabrina Galloway. Mercer shows up in time to defend himself, claiming that he's only doing this to build an army that will destroy the organizations when the time is right, and that of course the virus will go as well. Definitely, pinky swear, for realsies. Heller pretends to be stupid enough to believe him, and immediately hitches a ride to the Green Zone to catch up with Father Guerra, who has crucial information to share thanks to Athena. It turns out that after calling what the human Dr. Mercer did in the first game completely unforgivable, Blacklight Mercer decided to just return to Penn Station, where the last outbreak started, and release the virus again. I feel the need to point out that the thing that sent him over the edge was getting his heart broken by a woman in the comics, and I will talk about this later, because if I do it now, we will get sidetracked. Reeling from this confirmation that Mercer is in fact responsible for the death of his family, Heller follows the only lead he has and hunts down the newly minted Gentech CFO, Sabrina Galloway. Along the way, we discover Blackwatch is about to release a substance called White Light, allegedly a cure to the Blacklight virus, but shocker, so that was a fucking lie. We finally catch up with Galloway, and she turns out to be a slightly more genuine turncoat than Koenig. She's also weirdly horny for Heller, and I can't tell how much of that is her being manipulative or her being genuine, but I didn't care for it because it makes her inevitable betrayal come across as woman scorned, and did we really need a caddy seductress in this story about horrific viral outbreaks and revenge? I would argue no, but who am I to stand in the way of someone's corporate dummy mommy fantasies? Well, I am. So think about this. I've got Roland narrowed down to three possibilities, and I'll feed you all three. You take him out, I feed you more. And I stay alive. What do you say? Whose fucking side are you on? Mine. 
This camera angle and pose gave me flashbacks to Miranda from Mass Effect 2. No woman bends at a perfect right angle and sticks her ass out like this, and I know you could argue that it's because she's trying to seduce Heller, but again, why? Why write this and in such a blunt, heavy-handed way that you have the character in our first meeting with her essentially present to the player? Not to mention the way the camera moves almost gives it a feeling of found footage voyeurism at times, so when it lingers for a second on her ass before zooming in twice on the computer she's accessing just I I don't want to be here man but Morgan aren't you also into women correct but there is in fact a difference between what is made for me and what is made for straight men and while there may be some overlap most of the time I just get the ick genuine question for any men folk who are into women how do you actually feel about things like this like does it feel patronizing awkward funny enticing do you not care either way because i may generalize at times but i'm fully aware that you are individuals with your own intricacies and i can only speak for myself when a game suddenly throws ass at me as a player with the assumption that i am a straight man moving on father i found galloway and she says if i keep her alive she'll give up the locations of involved working for mercer already gave me one name Roland. Excellent. What's the problem? That bitch is crazy. Can't trust her. What? Excuse me? In what way did she display any craziness during that conversation? Did I miss when she went on a rant about pathetic humans and world domination? The whole conversation was Galloway bargaining to stay alive. She was calm and calculated, maybe a little bit sassy, and yes, weirdly flirtatious, but crazy? Anyway. Galloway has the ability to track the evolved, except for two, Heller and another called Roland. This is what she uses to bargain for her life, and she points Heller at three targets she suspects to be Roland. This involves infiltrating a rescue squad and moving her on the ground with them, which is nothing too special outside the dialogue between the soldiers. And when I say special, I mean... You know, some infected chicks are still pretty hot if you pop a bag over their heads. Okay, I don't want to sidetrack completely, but this line combined with references to brothels for Blackwatch soldiers and rampant cases of f committed against civilians felt like just another pebble added to the pile of this is what a Gen X edgelord thinks mature storytelling is. I'm not saying you can't write this subject matter, but pick a goddamn tone. Traitor. So, Roland escapes and Galloway is none too pleased. While she tracks him down all over again, Heller follows up leads on White Light and consumes Lieutenant Riley in the process, gaining a very important foothold in Blackwatch's hierarchy. After dining on a spread of doctoral donuts, Heller finally uncovers the truth about White Light. It's been contaminated by a culture taken from Mercer himself. Considering all of the everything that's come about because of Mercer spreading his essence everywhere, that's going to lead to nothing good. Father Guerra and Athena start hunting down the location of all the white light depots, and in the meantime, Galloway sends Heller after Roland again, this time into a lair which are underground dens of infection and pulsating fleshy growths. Once Roland is dead, Galloway and Heller have a little spat over Heller talking down to her, and he meets up with Father Guerra to deal with the white light operation. We're shown that between acting as mission control and spy for Heller, Father Guerra is doing what he can to help the less fortunate of the city in his own time. He points Heller to a location where they can do a small-scale release of the substance to see what it actually does. But before Heller can go, Father Guerra makes a point of beseeching him not to lose sight of himself in all this carnage and pain, something Heller brushes off with a gruff affirmation that he knows what is doing. Hmm, I wonder if anything is going to happen to Father Guerra after that exchange. Seems important. Anyway. Releasing white light causes the surrounding soldiers to immediately turn into the evolved, Mercer's own special little breed of infected who can think and shapeshift just like us. Heading to a larger depot with enough white light to infect the whole city, Heller is confronted personally with a very annoyed Mercer who berates him for not appreciating his gifts and proceeds to kill and consume Heller. Or he tries to, only for Heller to prove resistant. Feeling frustrated and spiteful, Mercer vows to make him suffer now and withdraws, leaving us to fight a Goliath and stop it from rupturing the white light tanks. I will say it was neat to encounter this thing again after being completely helpless in the beginning, now that we have the abilities to actually fight it. Unfortunately, we can't enjoy that triumph for long as Father Guerra calls us in dire need of rescue from the infected breaking into his hideout, and try as we might, we're much too late to save him. In a moment of perfect timing, Athena calls on Father Guerra's phone and the subtitles give away who she is before she does. The signal is spotty, but she tells Heller to meet her in the red zone, that she's Mercer's sister, and that she has information about his daughter, Maya. 
Infiltrating the heavily infected Red Zone, we intercept Blackwatch's efforts to capture Dana and meet up with her. Heller understandably tunnel visions on finding and saving Maya, completely disregarding Mercer or Blackwatch and the threat they pose to the city, but Dana talks him down, reasoning that Maya will die anyway if Mercer or Blackwatch get what they want. She can look for Maya while he deals with the guns and monsters, so he heads back out to do just that. Our first job is to destroy the supply of white light, which involves temporarily helping Blackwatch in their efforts to do that, grabbing containers of the stuff and yeeting it into incinerators they've set up. Blackwatch doesn't turn hostile to you over this, and it's actually kind of funny to listen to the commander freak out over it, because you're clearly helping and he doesn't know what to do with that, so they just kind of… let you. Of course, if they did react as usual, this mission would be impossible, so very temporary truce, I guess. Next, we're contacted by Galloway, who meets us in the Red Zone to discuss Project Firehawk and Commander Cantrell. Heller tells her to go back and dig up more, and bluntly dismisses her concerns about the danger of doing so. Treating her like this is definitely going to end well. After munching on multiple military men, it turns out Project Firehawk is a bombing run that'll use thermobaric rockets to completely decimate what remains of New York, hitting the red zone first, and while the projections say it'll completely wipe out the infection, it will also result in a million and a half civilian deaths, so not ideal. We wipe out the Blackwatch helicopters involved in the bombing run and have our final meet up with Galloway in the miserable ass end of the red zone behind a wrecked car. Super seductive locale. James, let's get the hell out of this place. Forget Mercer. We could build something all our own. We do make a pretty good team, don't we? I don't want to get between you and Mercer. Besides, I'd probably catch something. Sir, you are already a walking infection. That ship has long since sailed. Like, what is this line meant to imply? That Galloway is a whore and has the clap? In a conversation with Colonel Rooks, it's revealed that some federal agents have Maya, who has been sent to a lab and prepped for surgery. At this point, Heller is ready to do absolutely anything to save his daughter, and pleads with Dana to take care of her if something happens to him. This catches Dana off guard, but she eventually agrees, for which Heller is thankful. Heading out to very politely break Colonel Rook's skull open to find out where his daughter is being held, Heller stops just short of killing the man when he realizes that Rooks is talking to his own daughter on the phone. Yeah, that's sweet and all, but this is the same man who threatened to discipline a soldier because he stopped a civilian from being <laughs> by one of their own and compared saving that woman to saving a lab rat. The fact that he has a daughter isn't humanizing, it's horrifying. Despite this, Rooks continues to waste oxygen, and we target Dr. Trey Carson instead, the man in charge of experimenting on Maya, which reveals to us that the surgery planned for her is a vivisection. If you're blissfully unaware, a vivisection is the dissection of a living subject. In a controlled, moderately ethical setting, this is done with anesthesia and almost entirely on animals. In cruel and unfettered settings, like Unit 731, this has been performed, without anesthesia, on humans. Why are they doing this to a child? Unclear. It doesn't seem like Maya is infected since she's been dragged around by the wrist without anyone dying horribly, so the only point of interest is her genetic connection to Heller. Either way, yikes. There is a brief confrontation with Rooks again because he thinks Riley has been compromised by another agency, only for Heller to reveal that Riley is just a skin suit he's wearing and has been dead this whole time. However, Rooks lets him walk away because Heller insists he just wants to save his daughter, and also because he probably realized all the times Heller could have killed him and didn't. He later contacts Heller, just when it seems like Maya might be lost, challenging him to come get her from Gentech headquarters. We bust down the ludicrously durable front doors and run into Rooks, but instead of killing him, he kills two of his own men and lets Heller pass to get his daughter, telling him to get the hell out of his city. On some level, I appreciate Rooks not being completely one-note, characters should be nuanced even if they're terrible, but it doesn't make me want to turn him into a human smoothie any less. Unfortunately for Heller, it turns out Galloway beat him to his daughter and spitefully takes off to hand her over to Mercer. I mean, this might have been avoided if Heller wasn't written to be an abrasive tool towards her, but rest in peace, I guess. We arrive at the last confrontation with Mercer and his remaining evolved, including Galloway, where Mercer monologues about humanity being stagnant, giving it one body, one mind, no more conflict, disease, suffering, yada yada yada. Garden variety megalomaniac utopia shit. At least until this part, which skeeved the hell out of me. You see, young Amaya shares your brand of annoyingly resilient DNA. 
And when she's ready, your daughter will become the mother of the new world! Look, not that my saltine ass is qualified, but aside from the vibes of this being completely rancid, there's an extra layer of oh god oh no from a tyrannical white man using a young black girl to advance his plans. I don't think it's necessarily out of place considering that Mercer is very much positioned as a villain to be destroyed here. I just also don't think that the devs were in any way cognizant of race playing into the dynamic. The same can be said regarding the federal agents and doctors planning to perform a vivisection on Maya, when there is a history of horrific medical experimentation on black bodies with little regard or ethics, comfort or consent. Anyway, once Heller understandably refuses to back down, Mercer casually impales all of his followers, Galloway included, and consumes them all to give himself a massive advantage over Heller. Not that it helps him in the end, because he still gets clapped. <sighs> Welcome to the top of the food chain. Consuming Mercer reveals that both Dana and Maya have been locked away in a bank vault, and before he goes to let them out, Heller unleashes a torrent of tentacles to seek and destroy every infected in the Red Zone, seemingly ending the outbreak. Upon opening the vault, Maya seems to be afraid of her father's powers, and once they're safely on the roof looking at the sunrise, Heller begins to walk away, believing there's no place for him here as a monster who scared his own child. Thankfully, Maya stops him and the two share a hug, leaving the game to end on Dana's final line. What do we do now? The answer to that question turned out to be die as a franchise because we have heard exactly fuck and all since then. Thanks, Activision. With that, we are done with the plot for Prototype 2, and if you'd like to hear more in-depth thoughts about what I enjoyed, what I didn't, and how I'd change things, tune in next week. Thank you for watching, and special shout out to my supporters on Patreon, who are all very handsome people. If you'd also like to be called a very handsome people, check out the link in the description where you can support what I do for just one pound a month. Don't forget to drink your water, take your medication, treat yourselves kindly, and I will see you all next time.